Famous architects have all one thing in common. They know the importance to be different in order to stand out from the crowd and get noticed. Whether we're talking about the design itself, the overall concept or a specific element you added to your project, what is for sure is that whatever you design, you need your building to be remarkable, therefore memorable. Because things that get noticed get remembered and doing an average product for average people doesn't work anymore and I believe it never really did. It is true in architecture and it is actually true for any product you want people to buy and appreciate. Look, when you go to a store and let's say you want to buy a t-shirt, depending on your needs, you might look for a t-shirt with a specific brand, maybe a t-shirt that respects the environment, maybe a high quality t-shirt, or you're just going to look for the cheapest one. But you're not going to look for an average t-shirt. Only the same thing in architecture. I guess you've never heard a client ask for an average building. I personally never encountered that. You probably didn't neither. But it's normal because it's not what you expect and want when you're hiring an architect. Architecture is tightly connected to art. And like any artistic field, architecture is in its own nature looking for designs and concepts that have never been seen before. Every piece of land is different, every client is different, every architect is different, so every project is going to be different. And it's what we like about architecture. I'm pretty sure that people who get into this field aren't looking to copy one another. They want to create their own thing and it is what makes them happy and what they are looking for. But being remarkable, it's not only good for your creative ego, it's also going to make you solve the three biggest problems of any industry, which are competition, competition, competition. One day, hopefully, you will have clients coming to you thanks to the notoriety you acquired. But nobody was born with a reputation for being great at what they do. For being a great architect, for example, you will have to earn this reputation and there is no other option than compete against other architects. And it is where being different is essential because you're going to make your product stand out and if you do it well, you won't have to fight on price since you would have created a product that has unique benefits that you cannot find anywhere else. And when you think about it, all successful enterprises we know and like started by building a remarkable and unique product. Apple created the iPhone based on simplicity while everyone else seemed to make their phone more and more complicated. It's how they were different. Google stood out in the early 2000s with a simple interface way different from the other search engine at the time and if we take a more recent example, Tesla, who already was different with their usual cars, went a step further with their Cybertruck, which could be the definition of being remarkable. And it's working since more than 650 pre-orders have been received. So you get the point. We live in a noisy world and it becomes crucial for you, for anyone, to stand out and get noticed. But once I've said that, once we agree that we have to look for uniqueness, which is not much of a surprise, I believe, into the field of architecture, we have to define and understand what makes things different. Because being unique doesn't mean much by itself. You can only be different comparing yourself to others and what people are used to. If we put a skyscraper in Manhattan and a farm in the countryside of France, it would be like nothing happened, right? But if I put a 50-story skyscraper in a small village in the south of France, this is going to get noticed because it will be different from the expected landscape. So you could acknowledge that being unique is mostly a question of perspective and what you're comparing yourself to. And this concept has been popularized by Seth Godin that wrote a book about the importance of being remarkable called The Purple Cow. Think about this way. Cows, after you've seen one, two, or ten, are boring. Now, if you see a purple cow, that will be something that you would notice, right? Even after seeing thousands of brown cows. Well, with that in mind, the purple cow concept describes something phenomenal, something counterintuitive and exciting. Every day, consumers come face to face with a lot of boring stuff, a lot of brown cows. But you can bet that they will never forget a purple cow. And that's why in his book, Seth Godin urges you to put a purple cow into everything you build and everything you do to create something truly noticeable. 
and this applies to any industry and architecture is one of them. If you take your favorite architect, he or she is probably remarkable, either his or her style, a mindset, the concepts, something has to be remarkable. You cannot be like everyone else and expect to be noticed and appreciated. And famous brands are the best example for this. For example, Louis Vuitton, the famous luxury brand, that doesn't only apply this concept to their products but also to their architecture. When they are building a new store, they always try to make it as unique as possible, therefore as remarkable as possible. Just take the last store that opened in Tokyo last month, I believe. This is a remarkable building and people are going to talk about it. And even when the building is already in place, like in big cities like Paris or New York, it doesn't stop them from doing everything they can to get noticed. Look, this is the store in Paris and this is the store in New York. So when you work on a project, make something worth talking about, make something remarkable because ideas that spread usually win. But this is only the first part that's going to lead you to a successful journey in architecture. Because people who failed into this field, they usually don't fail because of a lack of creativity. They fail because they're missing a crucial point that architects usually don't work enough on. Let me explain. Architecture is the only kind of art that needs a client in order to make ideas becoming a reality. A painter can paint without any client and have a physical painting at the end of the day. A singer can create a song even if nobody asks him to. Same thing for a writer that can write a book before finding any client. But an architect will never be able to build the building he designed without a real client asking and paying for. It is why architects should not only focus on the creativity, but also on the persuasion. And it is why the selling part in architecture is to me crucial. And it is why it gets complicated for a lot of people because designing something original, finding a unique way to an architectural problem is a creative part. It is why architects become architects. But selling is different because it's not as creative and as fun, I would say, for architects. Yet, if you don't sell your project, it's going to stay on paper forever. And it's even harder when you try to sell something unique, different, like we mentioned before. Because people tend to be skeptical when they are faced with something new. And it is where it gets tricky because in a sense, people are hiring architects because they want something unique. But at the same time, there's a tendency in human nature that makes people stick with something we're used to and be skeptical about things we don't know. So it's why it's important to spend time preparing your speech, what you want to say and how you want to say it. And I believe that people in general and architects especially would benefit from preparing their selling speech because there's this weird tendency to think that our product is so good that it's going to sell itself. But this is never the case. Whatever you're doing, you will have to promote it. Look, let's take what some people will consider the most perfect product on earth, the iPhone. We can debate on the fact that it is perfect or not, but anyway, it is a great product. And it is great because Apple spends billions each year to make the best product they can. Yet, they will never say that their iPhone is so great that it's going to sell itself. And the proof is that they still spend almost 2 billion each year to promote their products. And it's the same thing for any product actually. Look, Coca-Cola is also a product that should sell itself. It's known by pretty much everyone on the planet and it is liked by a lot of people. But yet, the company still spends 4 billion a year on promotion. And it is the same thing with architecture. It doesn't matter how great your concept is, it is still worth taking the time and energy to promote it the best way you can. And you know this feeling when you have a good idea, you know it's a good one, you know it's worth something, but people just seem to don't get it, even after you spend energy trying to explain what you mean. This happened to me a lot, and after a while, I understood that it wasn't the product that had the problem. The product was indeed good, but I was missing the right way to present it. And knowing the right way to present your project can really make you go from an interesting artist to a real architect that gets to build what they 
design. So it's why I want to show you today an easy technique that you will be able to use at the end of this video and that will allow you to sell pretty much any unconventional design. And I found this technique looking at Norman Foster, who is one of the best architects alive. And the way he presents his ideas and why I think it's interesting to look at him is because he always has this tendency to rethink what architecture can be. Therefore, he always ends up with unconventional and remarkable buildings, yet he still succeeds to sell this original concept to his clients. So listen to his vision. I think it, it, it might be the way that we have rethought redesigned, reinvented um, the otherwise conventional, what was considered to be a traditional way of doing something. And that we'd done that by going back to roots, going back to basics and questioning from first principles. So this vision is very interesting and actually very common among famous architects. And just to go a step further to give you a sense of what is really going from first principle, I want to show you a short clip from not an architect this time, but from someone that wants to change the world and actually do from Elon Musk that explains what is this mindset. Uh, I think it's also important to reason from first principles rather than by analogy. So the normal way that we conduct our lives is we, 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 we reason by analogy. Um, it's We're doing this because it's like something else that was done, mm -hmm. or it's like what um, other people are doing. Because it's, it's, it's kind of mentally easier to reason by analogy rather than from first principles. But by first principles is kind of a physics way of looking at the world. And what that really means is you kind of boil things down to the most fundamental truths and, and say, okay, what are we sure is true or, or as sure as possible is true? And then reason up from there. Mm -hmm. uh, that takes a lot more mental energy. Um, Give me but, an example of that. Like, what's one thing that you've you've done that on that you feel has worked for you? Sure. So, um, somebody could say, um, in fact, people do, uh, that factory packs are really expensive, and that's just the way they'll always be because that's the way they've been in the past. Um, you're like, well, no, that's that's pretty dumb, you know, because if if uh, if you applied that reasoning to anything new, that ha then you, you wouldn't be able to, to ever get to that new thing. Right. And this is this mindset, I believe, that makes these people imagine, create and build unconventional products or buildings that answers well your client's problem because they are rooted in first principles. But what we often don't look at is a transition between an idea, a concept to a physical building because as I said, having a good idea isn't actually enough. So let's see how Norman Foster uses a great approach in order to show that his design is different, yet it is different because it is better. So first step before talking about your project is to build your own credibility. And I repeat that a lot in my videos because it is very important. It's a very important point to start any presentation. You cannot just come up to your client or the jury and try to impose your point of view. You have to introduce yourself to introduce the environment in which the project takes place. Mostly if your project is uncommon and never seen before. You have to show that you're not a reckless artist that does whatever he or she wants, but on the contrary, you actually know the domain you were asked to work in and the common ideas you're trying to disrupt. And Picasso summed up perfectly this mindset in one of his most famous quotes, which says, learn the rules like a pro so you can break them like an artist. This is so deep and true because it sums up pretty any famous artist life. Either it's a painter, a singer or an architect, they all started by following the rules of the domain until they reached its limit and therefore these artists felt like they needed to push the boundaries further so they created new rules. It's what Picasso did and it's what Norman Foster did. But look in the next clip how oh, Norman Foster, despite rethinking what an airport is, still starts his presentation reminding us what kind of airport we got used to and all the problems it comes with. An airport um, like Stansted, which again questioned the conventional idea of a terminal, which was that it was a sandwich of space 
and the roof had a lot of ducks with their handling plant on the top, which cooled the air. Lots of electric lighting then because you've got no natural light. So you've got the heat load of the lighting, very energy consuming and not very nice. I mean, claustrophobic, which is why airports had such a bad name. I already find this way to start a presentation amazing because in a sense it opens our eyes on the things that we know to be true but that we never really paid attention to. And basically Norman Foster tells us what Sherlock Holmes usually tells his partner Watson. You look but you don't observe. You know it's all these invisible problems that we are living with every day. Things that you notice the first time but that after weeks or months becomes invisible. For example, the barking dog in your neighborhood, the squeaky door in your house, or the little sticker you have to get rid of from the apple you want to eat. So Norman Foster manages to light up these things that we stop seeing and notice how he uses emotional terms to make you feel the pain you have to go through, like this example. Plant on the top, which cooled the air, lots of electric lighting then because you've got no natural light so you've got the heat load of the lighting and it's working since i'm sure you understand what he means and feel what he says and it's why it is such a great introduction because it really shows your client that you looked beneath the surface you really took the problem seriously and there's a good chance you point out things that your competitors didn't or at least didn't mention out loud and there is actually a second benefit using this technique is that it's going to grab people's attention and raise curiosity. Just imagine if you're the client that wants a new airport and an architect shows you step by step every single problem your airport had without you noticing. It's going to grab your attention, right? And you would want to know more about this architect's vision for your project. You want to know what is his solution. So you're going to raise curiosity. This is good, but you're also going to raise questions and it is where it can get dangerous because you are going to make people wonder why you're questioning the conventional concept because maybe there's a good reason for things to be the way they are and why would you be right against everyone else? And it is where using concrete details, using emotional words like Norman did is crucial because if you don't show proof of what you're saying, people are always going to go for the default mode the risk of switching would be too high. But if done right, people are going to understand that their usual vision is actually not optimal. And if there is another option, they will be happy to consider it also. It is at this moment that you arrive almost like a hero with your creative concept. And it's where the way you picture the problem in the first part of your presentation is very important. Since you framed the presentation, you chose to talk about the specific problems. In Norman's case, he focuses our attention on the handling, the lack of natural light and the energy efficiency. And of course, the key here is to talk in the first place about the problems your concept is going to solve. Look. When we reconsidered that and put all the air handling at the bottom underneath so that you could open the top to natural light and sunlight, so for most of the time you didn't need electric light. You suddenly had something that was joyful, that would uplift the spirits, and suddenly becomes popular with the most important people who are the paying customers. Um, it's also energy efficient. Now I can, if I describe that, I'm describing several different stories. I'm telling you one about energy consumption. I'm telling you one about joy. I'm telling you one about how you build a building. And I'm telling you another about how you question and challenge. You see how choosing the right problem to talk to in the first part of your presentation can be key. Because if you found a solution to these problems, it's going to make your project look so much better in comparison to what is already there and what we expected. So this is a very easy way to prepare a presentation. At least it's a good start because it's only a two steps uh, structure that you can use. And first is acknowledging the usual environment, what people are used to, and point out all the problems there is with this conventional design. And second is to show your concept with a solution to the list of problems you just described. 
And this is such an easy and impactful way for presenting architectural projects that Norman Foster seems to use this structure for every unconventional design he has to present. Because look in the next clip how he's presenting with the same structure, exactly the same structure I just described. Not an airport this time, but a tower he had to build in Hong Kong. So if you take a tower, conventionally it has a central core. Um, when we question that on the building immediately behind me, the Hong Kong Bank, there were very good reasons for rejecting that model, even though if you analyze pretty well every tower on the planet, it would have a central core. So we broke with that tradition. We reinvented the tower by fragmenting the core, putting it on the ends. Again, you can see it. So you have free space. So you can see from one side to the other, it's not blocked and it's flexible. So you could put even a dealer's room, which would be unthinkable in a tower. And that's exactly what they did. So you see how simple and efficient your presentation can be using this structure. And the way Norman Foster says it, either for the airport or the tower, it really makes us feel and wonder what have we been doing in the past, why we haven't seen and changed that before. But anyway, if you use this technique right by making your story very natural, like Norman does, you can really appear almost like a genius that the field of architecture was waiting for, or at least the genius that your client was waiting for. Because you're solving a problem they have been living with probably for years, and you're probably the first one taking care of this problem maybe without them asking you. And this all has to start by showing the invisible problems. And this is actually exactly what I'm doing with this YouTube channel. I want to show you the invisible reason that makes architects successful. So it is why I'm really focusing on the design itself because this is obvious, but whether I'm focusing on all those things that have an impact on whether or not you'll be successful, yet, the things that we don't pay attention to. Like the strategy you have for your project, the strategy you can have for your career, or just the way you present your project. Because I would argue that these elements are as important as the design itself. And I believe that in architecture, creativity without a strategy is like a bird without wings. You can have the most beautiful bird in the world, it's not going to go anywhere. Thank you for watching, I hope you found this video interesting and if you want me to analyze one of your favorite architects, please let me know in the comment section. And if you want to see more of this type of content, please subscribe, give me a like so it shows me that you want more of this type of content. Until then, see you.